Larson sat at his desk and ordered everything else in the office. On any normal day, he would have been troubled concentrating while Robert sprayed air freshener towards Bowles' desk, while Bowles bellowed at Roberts for spraying Bellow's garlic-heavy meatball sandwich while two drunk bikers hauled for in a fighting continuing trying to assault each other. And while the rest of the people in the office either talk on the phone or to one another, but today wasn't a normal day. Today, a marching band could have been doing formalities between the desk and Larson wouldn't even care. Today, he was on to something, or at least he thought he was. Bending over the papers and photos in front of him, guarding them with his elbow so he didn't have to explain his ideas to anyone else, Larson first poured over the photos of the Phineas Taggart crime scene. They showed exactly what he remembered seeing when he arrived at the facility of Crazy Scientist Laboratory conversation weeks before. Viewing the scene has been like looking at a modern day Frankenstein's lab. The room where the scientist's remains have been found have been packed full of scanning equipment, modifications of incompression of ways and hooked up to the strange collection of junk he never seen. Much of the junk has just been mysterifying as the equipment modifications, gears and hinges and mannequin parts and antique compressions that look like medieval torture devices. But one collection of junk had been combined with a specific disturbing way. Looking at it had twisted Larson's inside and put his blood in deep freeze because he'd been so rattled by what he was looking at. He hadn't looked at it closely, now he realized he'd been an idiot. He should have looked harder. If he had, he had figured out what the switch rave was a lot faster. Or would he have? Even if he put it together, it might have been taking him some time to come to terms with it. Although he was sure now, he wasn't totally sure because of what he sure was totally insane. If he was truly certain, he'd be telling his colleagues. Instead, he was peering at the evidence as if it was a treasure he wasn't willing to share. Larson looked at the junk collaboration that had horrified him, and he knew he was looking at the beginning of the strange figure he was looking for. In the photo he held, the doll's head could have been seen only from the side. That's how Larson had seen in Phineas' laboratory as well. This is why Larson hasn't immediately recognized the sketch face when he's seen the pictures of the chef envelope, the chief's envelope. But that head, he was sure it was the head, it was attached to the metal endoskeleton. Okay, the mystery figure has always described as wearing a hood cloak, but Larson remembers seeing a long and venomously blonde trench out coat in Phineas's cl clothing that could easily have been misleading as a cloak. Larson sat down the photo. He began reading through the inventory list of Phineas's property. Running his fingers down the list, he read the items aloud under his breath. He stopped at the tenth item down. There it was. One robotic dog. One robotic dog. Dismembled. Manufactured by Fazbear Entertainment. Larson looked at the endoskeleton again. It seems to have an addition. So part of the dog could have been used on the endoskeleton. Okay, so we have an animatronic endoskeleton linked to a part that came from a Fazbear Entertainment robotic dog. Was he making too much of a leap connection to Dots? The dog was connected to Fazbear Entertainment which was connected to Freddy's murderers, and the dog connection to the ding of the sketch face. So that meant Larson currently investigation could have connected to Freddy's murders. A paper airplane on the top of Larson's bent head, he slapped it and frowned, looking up. Earth to Larson, Robert said. The detective's close gray eyes were aimed at the photos Larson was shielding. I asked what you were doing, thinking. Thinking about what? Stupid stuff, probably. No way was Larson was going to tell his strange arrow partner wearing a redder jacket with lettered elbow patches and too proud owner of a perfectly groomed goatee about his fledgling theory. Want me to grab some lunch? No thanks. Robert stared at Larson for a moment. Larson stared back. His face was blank as he could make it. Okay, Robert said. Larson shot the paper plane back across his desk to Robert. Nice one, he said. Hoping to distract Robert from any suspicion that Larson was onto something. Robert had almost as proud as his achromatic paper airplanes as he is to his facial hair. Robert grinned. Thanks. He got up and strolled away from his desk. Larson waited until Robert was gone. Then he stood. He needed to get over the evidence locker. He chewed on his theory on the way. The old stone building had originally housed 
the city police department, but this was now the department's axis, where the more obscure functions of the police department were carried on and where, carried out and where, all records and evidence were kept in the evidence locker. Musty basement aisles. Larson stood at the step ladder and pulled a stack of three better boxes from the shelf above the head. Setting them on the floor, all three boxes side by side, Larson squatted in front of them and took off their lids. He coughed when the pressure odor of smoke waffled up into the boxes. Then he peered into the each box. Larson's heart rate went onto something mode, something loud and fast in his chest. The fire, so far in the past in almost ancient history to the department, had never been solved. Larson didn't know a lot about it. But he did know the fire was connected to one of the founders of Fazbear Entertainment. The idea that if the Stitchray was connected to Fazbear Entertainment and was seen at the site of the fire, the Stitchray might have been looking for something that had been into evidence years ago. He didn't think it was too much of a stretch to reach this conclusion, but the first three boxes didn't do much to bolster this theory. He replaced their lids and climbed up the step ladder. He climbed back down, shifted the ladder, climbed back again and pulled another stack of boxes from the shelves. This time, he took the lids off one at a time. When he took the lid off the third box, he raised an eyebrow and nodded. Grim hadn't been back in the railway yard since he'd seen a mysterious figure praying loose parts of the track. Something about the figure had done more than just make his teeth hurt. It had made him want to dig a very deep hole and crawl into it. Since he didn't have a shovel for the strength to dig such a hole, Grim had decided instead of move his usual hangout place to the far end of town, where abandoned factories rub shoulders with several stalwart old neighborhoods in the west dock of the lake, he found a rusty but sturdy shed just outside one of the abandoned factories. A factory that had been recently vacated by a shabby forklift stall shelf nearby. The shed, although watertight and clean, had been discovered by anyone else like Grim, so he set up house under that long, wide shelf below, a dirty window, because he knew others would be attracted to such to such deserted locates. He was happy that he found the shelf in the shed and made a suit-able logging platform for keeping the eye on his surroundings. And if it was a good thing, he kept an eye out, because on the third night of the shed, he spotted a mysterious figure. Happy that he was at least in his usual crazy thoughts tonight, he still had trouble continuing to breathe as he watched the figure drag a bag through a double garage door size opening in the boxy metal factory shell. What compelled him to follow the figure is to see where it went. Was it curiosity? He felt the last time he seen the figure? Or was it perhaps some self-destructive urges? Maybe it was the crazy voice in his head. Whatever it was, Grim found himself scurrying stealthily and perhaps a bit unstealthily towards the opening into the figure disappear. When he reached it, he hesitated for a second, questioning the wisdom of his actions, but he went through the opening anyway. Preparing to be jumped the second he entered, Grim was surprised and relieved to find himself in an empty, triple garage-sized space that went into another space beyond. And he was more surprised and pleased to hear the movement of the second space and see through enough light to pick up his way over the debris, sturdy concrete floor. The dragging movement he heard was dis concerning and would have sent any normal person running for their lives. Graham, however, hasn't been normal for several years. When Graham reached the front edge of the second space, he paused, he waited, listened until the scrap and squash sound of the dragging bag was far enough away to make him a felt fairly certain he could follow without running into his quarry. It didn't take long for him to feel like he should make his move. Taking a deep breath of courage, he took another step, and he stopped. He was in a huge square expanse, an expanse of flat walls and high ceilings, an expanse filled with piles of junk. He figured this is the main floor of the old factory. It was at least a couple thousand square feet in size. And it's... High ceiling peaked the belt skylights, which allow murky daylights and brighten the area. Grim realized he stood out the elevated rim of the floor. A... Rim of fifteen feet wide, it ran along the perimeter of the long of the huge space. Several sets of concrete stairs with metal stairs, stale rail, had down the level at six feet lower. 
On that level, the one side of Canterbury Space and massive dirty blue trash compactor was set to part way into the concrete floor. It had a filthy, scared clue that led from the elevated rum down in its metal bowels. It was quiet and still now, but Grip couldn't imagine it in action, pummeling trash and then tripping over the shallow concrete pit near at the end of those lethal closure. Near the trash compactor clock, a small self hung on the wall. The shelf had a pot of two bright red flowers shaped like a starfish. Grim couldn't imagine anything looking more out of place than those flowers did next to the power eater of trash. Grim Blakenham watched the cloaked figure drag his bag to one of the junk piles. He couldn't see what the bag was, but he glimpsed the doll's arm hanging from the opening, dressed in a bright blue dress with equal bright ruffles. The arm looked so innocent and sweet. It didn't belong in a room of metal and McLean junk. Nothing belonged in such a room. Because the junk of this room wasn't just any junk. It was junk of nightmares. A junk of blood girly history. The junk of this room was a collection of the worst mechanism monstrosities imagined. Spying the remains that he had seen remove the tracks, Grimm also saw a caress of robotic dog and a several part to animatronic characters. It looked like someone had blown a factory of creepy robotic toys and then piled their remains. Not even the crazy voice in his head could have convinced Grimm to stay in this room. He backed down and retreated as quietly as fast as he could to his rusty shed. Jake, aware that he was being watched and not concerned about it because he could sense the soul and the character of the person watching, emptied the last bag of infected items and shortly piled the abandoned factory. It made him sad to see Doll's arm. Well, all of it made him sad. Actually, Toys shouldn't have been things that held horror and anger and fear. They should have contained for joy and love and laughter. Ever since Andrew had told Jake about all the infected things, Jake has been using the thing he and Andrew were in to gather all the stuff Andrew had infected. When he first had the idea to do that, he wasn't sure if he actually do it. He didn't know what he and Andrew were, were in then, just that it was made of metal and could move. But now he understood that he was an animatronic endoskeleton, run by a battery pack, and he understood that by looking at the world through a doll's eyes, none of it felt strange to him. The only thing he thought was funny was that the thing they were in the wearing a hooded trench coat. Going around in trench coat felt really silly. And it was hard to go over these things, harder than he thought it would be. Andrew had infected so much stuff. Jake had understood how tiring it was going to be to use his will to get the locations from Andrew's mind and make the animatronics go all over the place, finding the stuff. Jake was feeling so worn out, it was like he, before he felt his left his little boy body. He wasn't sure he could keep go, doing what he needed to do. Maybe he, he should just give up and let go. Jake hadn't done anything wrong. Why did he have to be the one to fix Andrew's mess? Wasn't he a good boy? Didn't he deserve some fun? I think we need... Peanuts. Don't you, Jake? A smiling man asked. A crowd cheered and a different man called out. Hot dog! Get your hot dogs here! Maybe a hot dog too, the smiling man said. Jake froze with the empty bag in his hand. Was that a memory? Did he just have a memory? He cocked his head. Since he's been in the metal endoscale, he hadn't had a sense of smell, but now he felt like he was inhaling the aromas of peanuts and hot dogs. He could also feel something new. His face, or the face of what he was in, suddenly felt warm, like he was outside the bright sunlight instead of where he was, inside, in a dingy factory. This had to be a memory, because it was for sure wasn't happening right now. It felt like a memory, and the man in his memory had said his name. No, wait, it wasn't just a man. It was his dad. Jake had experienced a memory of his dad. What are the flowers for? Andrew asked. Jake ignored him. He was concentrating. The memory. That's what it was had felt really good. Jake had, Jake wanted more of it. He was closing his eyes and focused on the smells and sounds of the centuries. Let's have both, Jake said. Jake's dad said. He motioned, and a man came over and tray full of roasted peanuts in small bags. Jake felt himself sell in his little boy body. He looked out through the window boy's, the little boy's eyes, and he saw a big field of grass and huge crowd of people. Jake, what about the flowers? Andrew asked. Jake didn't answer. Instead, he picked up a watering can he left under the shelf holding a power, a power pot. He walked over the wa to water the flowers. At the same time, he returned to his memory. 
As Jake watched his dad exchange money for one of the bag of the tray, understanding came back to him. For the first time since he became aware of being an animatronic, he was now in. He fully knew himself as truly was. He was Jake, the little boy. And he was reliving the afternoon of the baseball game with his dad. It felt so real and... Jake began to feel like he was being sunk out of the memory. He felt like he was a puff of smoke, and he was being broad from an air carefully away from the being of the contain him. He could feel himself being pulled into the memory itself, and he intrusively understood that if he was involved in the memory, he could stay in the happy place forever. The crack of the, of the bat resound, and the crowd rise in the feet cheering. Get your glove up, Kate, Jake. His dad shouted. Jake raised his baseball glove hand, and he drifted even further from the animatronic he'd been in, Jake. Where are you going, Jake? Andrew shouted. Jake realized he could easily relax in the wonderful memory and allow the whole of who he was to be extracted from the animatronic that contained him and Andrew. He could stop trying so hard. He could go have fun. Jake! Andrew called out, but Jake couldn't have Andrew. His new... But Jake couldn't leave Andrew. His new friend had never known love, and if Jake left, Andrew would have been lost forever. Jake couldn't let that happen. Jake looked hard at the piles of trash in the compactor. He forced the memory from his mind. By putting his whole attention on what he was here now, he wiped the memory away from his awareness like he was erasing a blackboard. As he did, he settled back into this place of the animatronic. He watered the flowers, and he ignored Andrew's repeated question.